It's the playoffs. Come out to Mall of America this Sunday for a playoff championship series watch party from 1.30 to 3.30. The game will be streamed live on the big screen in the Huntington Bank Rotunda with tons of fun prizes, games for all ages. Full details, KFAN.com, keyword calendar. Couple programming reminders. We are going till uh, six tonight, correct? Six o'clock. Yes. And it looks like um, after we get, well, we probably don't have any Vikings programming to worry about because it's bye week. We've got uh, Minnesota Timberwolves preseason action. Is that correct? In my stomping grounds. Is that right? In Des Moines, Iowa. Des Moines, mm-hmm. Iowa. Yeah, they like to move the, the those NBA preseason games around to places that would not otherwise get that presence. Um, so that's the plan tonight. Uh, so it's not summer hours tonight at six, but it is to get to, um, Minnesota Timberwolves preseason basketball. Also with John, with, I should say, Guardsy already in Los Angeles, John Athletic joins me and Lori Fisher on the Enough Said program today, which in the case of both the plus and on Fox 9, have late arrivals. I want to say on, on 9, it's not until 11, maybe even 11.05, and it might be 10.30 on uh, the Plus because we've got so much sports programming. I believe on uh, Fox 9, it's Major League Baseball playoff action. So Johnny with me filling in very admirably for uh, Garzi on the, well, occasionally Emmy-nominated, but not this year, enough said program so i hope you will uh, watch or if that's too late for you at least dvr and uh, perhaps watch tomorrow perhaps for breakfast who's to say what might work for you uh minnesota wild when they're op- we were at of course at the x had a really nice program on the green carpet yesterday a good extended conversation with bill garen um and at least i think was it two i think we had two uh, current minnesota wild uh, players as well and um, I think all in all, it, it was a very productive session for all of us. Russo Radio basically spent the entire 4 o'clock hour with us. He also filled in for PA, I believe, today as well. So uh, what did you take out of the opener, the Wilds victory in the opener, that you think might be useful? Um, I, I think Zuccarello said it the best in the post game that it really wasn't their best and I, and I thought that last year when they didn't have their best, they were punished and it was ugly. And I mean, granted, Columbus isn't that. I don't know for how much we're expecting from no, Columbus. Not they're, a lot, not, they're not a great squad, but you know, it, it is still the NHL. And if you don't have your best and still find a way to win, it's the oldest cliche in sports. Good teams find ways to win. I, it was all right. It was fine. It, it, there's not enough there for me to be Debbie Downer about it, but there, the second line was really good, obviously, um, with Boldy, uh, Johansson, who, who I hand up. I still probably want Lee Mogren in that spot, but hey, you get two assists a night. You'll, I'll put my hand down real fast. Um, it, it was fine, but I, I'm expecting more, um, to see a more polished team. It's the Kraken tomorrow night. Um, and, and Gus then, was good. And then Gus was quite good, was he not? And um, by the way, I don't know that. W- where are you on this? The three goaltender experiment. Do you think people have overcomplicated it again? Um, hockey, like baseball, is a very complex sport, and a lot of times the folks who are on the wrong end of that they don't understand that they're too stupid to follow the game or pr- properly evaluate the game or even evaluate the ins and outs of, for example, attempting to start a season with three goaltenders. Are we obsessing? too much over this, that it's really not that complicated, and in fact, there's ways to do it. It's not that big a deal. Uh, when the kid doesn't play, we can send him down to the farm. Uh, it doesn't have to be turning turned into this major controversy, or do you agree with Louis, who is skeptical that, for, from a rhythm standpoint, that you can sort of keep three goaltenders at what you might say their best, and their fre- not necessarily their freshest, but their best, getting into a groove if they're playing as intermittently as they might, as the three goaltender approach seems to suggest they want to do. I, I think my biggest concern is the ego factor of it. I, I don't think they have any. I don't think between the three, between Flower, Gus, and Wally, that there's going to be an ego that goes, why are we splitting in between the three of us? I should be getting this amount of starts. I hope that's not the case. But, I mean, Walsett, they've basically said he's got a place up here, and he's going to go down 
basically whenever they see fit that they need they need to get him another game. Personally, I know hindsight's twenty twenty. I wish they would have just traded someone and left. I think they tried. I'm sure they did, but but you don't want to give them away. By no. the way, I don't even think you can rule out the possibility that that could happen before the deadline this year. That's also possible. Right? Um, at, well, I, they hem themselves in when Flurry is, you know, and we love Flurry. I love Flurry. You, you know, I'm a Flurry apologist. I but, was hoping originally we had been led to believe there was a chance we were going to get him on yesterday. I would have loved that. Oh, that would with been his great. history. It would have been a lot of fun, but it didn't work out, unfortunately. But with the the will he won't he retire? Uh, is yeah. this his last year? I think this is officially his last year. I think. Not 100%, but I thought I read that somewhere. So that kind of throws a wrench to it because you sign him to another one-year deal. Yeah. So my number one priority right now is is getting Wallstead starts. I think he's done all that he can yeah. in Iowa. Well, So uh, that's yeah. what I want. I mean, to your point, a text just came in on this, and I think there's some truth to it, that that oh, um, yeah. Yeah, you, that you want Gus to do well and then be traded by game 20. But you know what? <laughs> Speaking of Bill Guerin... Who uses that expression a lot? I'm not gonna argue with the notion that Garen doesn't want the same thing. I mean, I I really do believe if the other two goalies are going good, especially the kid, mm-hmm. and if this is sort of like a rebirth year, a a great recovery by Gus Bus, I don't think it'd be shocking at all. That they would end up trading him now. The, the issue that you get into is: would it if this if it's a good season? Are you disrupting the vibe of what has gotten you to that place? How that goes back to I guess how convinced you are that the two goalies you have left are ready. You know what Flowers' history is, but you know you don't want to play him every night. Is the kid ready for a, a heavy enough load? Because presumably, if Gus Bus, and this is I think part of the what made it difficult to trade him in the off season, he came off of he was off of a bad season. And presumably, if he plays well, then maybe the, the the price tag goes up a little bit, and you get a little bit more for him. Yeah, and maybe there's a goalie that goes down, but uh, and someone needs one desperately. The, the fact of the matter is, they've circled since they've drafted him. Wallstead's name has been circled in red or in yes. sharpie or whatever as this is going to be our guy of the future. This is going to be our ace, so to speak, for years and years to come. And mm-hmm. he was he was. Thought of that way in the draft. He's been thought of it out of the draft. Uh, I still am bitter about how they just threw him to the Wolves in that one game. I think it was in Dallas and then sent him right back to Iowa and the team didn't play in front of him at all. But he's our guy. And I think the I don't buy into the he's going to he's going to kill his confidence if he comes up and he gets shelled like he, well, they're you, professional at, at yeah. some point. He's got to play. That's you true. Know? Yeah, I'm, uh, that, so. that's that's undeniable. Uh, grand in your hand time? Uh, yes, it is. The fan of two men and a junk truck want to give you a shot. To put a grand in your hand at the National Cash Contest, head to KFAN.com, enter the keyword bills for the sour. Keyword bills, KFAN.com, keyword bills. Uh, ben Gessling is going to join us in about 15 minutes, and Lavelle apparently coming into studio for what could be a very, very controversial, tense hour, or maybe a little bit less, because we are out at 6 o'clock, the Minnesota Timberwolves preseason action right here on The Fan. Inflation Vacation is back on KFAN. We have nine chances for you to win $1,000 every weekday. That's every hour from 9 a.m. till 5 p.m. Tend to the keywords and learn more. Head over to KFAN.com. It's brought to you by two men and a junk truck. When you left, you cut me deep. Nothing ever hurt me more. As I mentioned, Ben Gessling will join us at the bottom of this hour, and Lavelle is going to stop by our location for at least a decent chunk of the five. Are you prepared for a top five at five today? I hope so. I will be. Okay, that's good. Yeah, there's no reason that we should not have one. The Bradshaw and Brian KFN text line is open, 64686. Uh, let's get to a few texts that have come in on a variety of subjects. Uh, Dan, it's been said this week that Garen wants to win a cup in the next five years. I think the owner has talked about a five-year plan. This is year two of five. Obviously not Flower, but which goalie do you think they they think wins that cup here is a goalie, uh, as a goalie, is that person on the roster right now? Well, they sure as all hope so, right? I mean, I, I have to believe they think the kid is would be that guy. Now, there's a lot of other ifs involved with that in that scenario, but I would think that's the case. If they trade Gus and Flurry retires, who is their second goalie? 
Well, Flurry's not going to retire during the season. Is I he? think he's saying for next season. Okay, for next season. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a problem. It's a problem, but then you're back. Yeah, I guess it is. But am I dis- am I dismissing the role too much to say? Yeah, it, the, the second the, the backup quarterback analogy is not very good, right? Because the way it works these days, second goalies play a lot in the league. So yeah, that potentially could be an issue. Do we have anybody else on the farm that I don't know about? I, or is I there, assume, I they, assume they, they feel like they could get somebody that's that what might I be would available think at a too. relatively cheap price. Yeah, I would say that that's a free agent pickup. Yeah, in my opinion. Um, four ninety four is closed all weekend between seventy seven and Highway one hundred. So that oh. MOA event Sunday could lead to a lot of road rage. What am I? What's the MOA event? Is there an MOA event? Um, there is a. I, don't, I want to say this correctly. Okay. There is a playoff series championship oh. watch party. Oh, my. That's how it's written. So I didn't realize that. Is that accurate? If you know what, 484 closed all weekend between 77 and Highway 100. Sheesh. That would be a major uh, yeah. loss for sure. And then 62 is going to get slammed. Yeah. Ugh. Um, we got some Packer fan connections. <laughs> Texts that have come in. I'm going to try to get... Back behind Did you read any the of the of those? the frequently asked questions? <laughs> no, I'm afraid to. I mean, are they? Um, well, there's one picture that coincidentally, you know, it's only coincidence, but looks kind of like Guardsy a little bit. Oh, okay. And one of the questions is, will the one guy in the turtleneck be at the event? He's a hottie, not as hot as Coach Matt, but who is? And mm. and the answer is. We can't say one way or the other, but be ready for surprises. Be ready for surprises. Think about it. Oh, that's too good. Uh, Dan, does MLB have the legal opportunity to decline a buyer if they deem the buyer to be poll ad like Seems that having a similar ownership group as the existing failed one would fail the objective. Uh, la- last of the league's interest in expanding interest and therefore viewership. I don't think owners think that way. I mean, there, there's enough, you know, God knows there's enough teams that are even cheaper Um when it comes to payroll issues and never seem interested in joining the the fray, one could say the battle. Uh, So, no, I don't think, um, I think generally the opportunity to say yay or nay has more to do with what do they have the money? Are they, will the checks clear Uh, and less to do with, is this an owner who's going to spend the right kind of money? I mean, I think you go in just vetting how much money, the ownership group has generally there's a billionaire to start and then maybe you get some other people involved in that um you know so it becomes more of a group thing i don't believe there's a thing where you go well how much money are you going to be willing uh to spend dan professional sports perils are like food as it relates to body bodily health too much can equate to fat too lean and you don't die but you aren't thriving you need to invest not spend invest into the right positions that align with your organizational strengths, weaknesses, culture, and leadership. Paul has never figured that out in the past 30 years. There's a lot of word salad there. Um, and so I wasn't quite prepared for, I thought he was actually going to go in a different direction. I think part of the, <laughs> what's the word I'm looking for? Challenge? There's a better word than challenge, but I'll go with challenge for right now. Is I would have to the ball guys is at what payroll level would they be bothered? You know, what's the line? Because I mean, you can you can play the game any way you want to, and I'll ask Lavel this between five and six. You could say, well, what were they at this last year? It was a hundred and this year's one hundred thirty million, one hundred thirty two, right in that range. You say. Well, they really, I mean, there are teams, look at even the division, there are teams a lot cheaper than that. So uh, why 130? Why not 100 million? Why not 92 million? What, what, because there, there, I would assume even with the ball guys, there has to be a number, but the way they attempt to use their, I think, perverse logic on it, you can, you can turn on them and say, well, why 130? Why not 110? No guarantees that that extra 20 is going to make a difference. So for the ball guys, what's what's their line where they then feel they have permission 
to question what ownership is doing. Because as we said several times, despite this notion that this is a complicated, nuanced concept, it isn't. For most Twins fans, for most fans, except the most warped of them, it's not complicated. There's knowledge that responsibility is almost always shared and that yes or no, there is no guarantee that if you spend to a certain level that you are guaranteed to win whatever, win a division, make a, a, a deep postseason run. Um, I think what you try to do is to say, if, if I'm evaluating what failed here, I mean, honestly, it's I, one of the main reasons I'm shocked that the poll ads are doing this, if indeed they're doing it because they're tired of being hit upon. And I'm not even entirely convinced that's the reason they would do this sort of thing anyway. But if that's the premise you want to accept, I'm still surprised because in the baseball circles, they've got people enabling them and supporting them endlessly who constantly are reminding us, the, the Lavelles of the world, that, oh, I'll, I'll give you the list of the teams that spent more money that did worse or the teams that spent less money and did better than the Twins. So I'm not even sure there's that much, there was that much pressure on the Paulettes because in the ball guy circles, they have been supported. They have, they're in a place where they can apparently never be blamed for anything. The only individuals who can be blamed for anything are the players if they don't get the job done. And again, as I said earlier, most baseball fans are, have no difficulty noticing if players play below their level of expectations that that contributes to a team collapsing the way the Twins did. The question was, might there have been some buffers that gave you a give you a better chance to withstand that collapse, or maybe that collapse is not quite as dramatic, and you pick up three games here, four games there, five games, and that's the difference between you making it and and not making it. Your margin for error, by any standard, any complex, nuanced standard, was reduced the way the Twins decided. Uh, to go about their business. And lastly, I said this the day the, the right size, the payroll quote came out. It's their team. I've never denied that they had the right to do it. But only a fool would be shocked, dismayed, surprised that fans would notice. <laughs> right? I mean, it, it's it, you can do whatever you want to do. But apparently, according to the ball guys, fans are supposed to take it without a whimper. There's not supposed to be bothered by it. There's there's nothing to be upset about because this team has done better with lower payrolls. Other teams have done better with lower payrolls. So why would that bother you? That's the part of this that makes absolutely no sense to me that folks weren't supposed to respond, apparently. They weren't supposed to notice. They were supposed to know that it's only about whether the players answer the bell or not. And by the way, a lot of the guys that we might have wanted, they didn't do so good which I guess is permission for ownership to say, no point in trying. There's no guarantees. So why even bother? And then my comeback to that would be, well, then why bother continuing to own the team at all if that's the credo you live by? If, if, if you're that limited in your thinking, then I'd say you have every right to do it, but give somebody else maybe the opportunity to either look at it differently, even if it's a honeymoon period. I think your average Twins fan would be delighted if you get five a five-year honeymoon period with a new ownership group that ultimately learns the error of their reckless spending ways and goes back to doing it the poll ad way, the tried and true poll ad way. They say, I'll take the five. And by the way, maybe if it goes well during two or three of those five, the five gets extended to ten. Or ben, maybe by then also, there's a new, per, new, new what's the word I'm looking for? A new... Um, state-of-the-art approach when it comes to maximizing regional money revenue, you know, revenue from from your, a, a new regional network, whatever that vision might be in the future, the assumption that it's screwed up now doesn't mean it always has to be screwed up. Part of the reason it's screwed up is no one really is creative enough to come up with the answer. And, and, and maybe there's never going to be anything like there was for the Twins, regionally speaking. 
but who's to say? Bottom of the hour break. Let's go back get back to some football talk. Uh, Vikings are off this week, the fan has learned, but Ben Gessling never stops working, I don't think. We'll find out if he got any time off. His reaction to the London trip, to uh, the Vikings' performance, and what we might have coming for Lions Week as well. If you have questions for Ben, hit the Bradshaw and Bryant Cafe and text line 64686. Time now for the Vikings Report on the fan. Presented by Miller Lite. Viking safety Cam Bynum joins Barrero next. After this, from Miller Lite. Fan. What do you got for Ben Gessling? This is a great opportunity, given that it is bye week, to maybe get into some obscure area regarding your favorite football team, the Vikings, or the National Football League. Then again, it doesn't have to be obscure. Maybe you think it's quite obvious, but hasn't been addressed. Bradshaw and Brian KFN text line is open, 64686. Gessling joins us, brought to you by our good friends at Standard Heating and air conditioning. So how does it work for you by week post London? Do you get like a couple of days off given that they're five and oh, is that there's no rest for the weary? Uh, what's the last few days been like and the few days coming before lions week? Well, it's been a little mixture. I suppose we haven't had quite as much news to this point, but you're kind of always keeping an eye out for things. They've had a few roster moves and then, the newsletter uh, still comes out every week, so got that done. Um, have been working ahead on a couple things, so it's been quieter, but I wouldn't say it's been quite a vacation yet to this point. I, I did take a couple extra days in London where I wasn't uh, doing quite nice. as much work with there with my family. So I've I've probably – it's as good as it's going to get during the season. I guess I'd say it that way. It's you, You're never going to get a full – respite from it but uh, a little bit of a break goes a long way your most memorable non-vikings game moment in london well <clears throat> um i i would say a couple of things we did a couple of different touristy things we went to a comedy of errors at the globe theater which was really fun mm. and the, a couple of shakespeare productions there my kids have, have gotten really into that so that was cool we did the harry potter uh set thing uh did the big tour of that my kids are, are big harry potter fans so that was a lot of fun and then it was noticeable how many vikings fans were there we did a event on saturday at the greenwood pub which was the place the vikings had taken over and the lines were out the door not necessarily because of us but it was uh i mean just a lot of vikings fans congregating there and that was i've done all four of these london games that was noticeably different than what we've seen the last couple of times there. And I don't think these London games are stopping for them, but the fan response to this one was, I think, pretty significant just from seeing that walking around and and uh, going to the event on Saturday night. Is So is that about the 5-0 and start? Is it about a more concentrated effort to, to market and even create on game day, it appeared, a home field sort of scenario where it felt like it was very close to a Vikings home game. What do you think all what's contributing to that? I think it's a few things there. I mean, I do think the fact that they've been there four times now, you, you talk to people that say they got into the Vikings. Actually, I talked to a couple of fans from the UK that said they got into them back during like the Favre Adrian Peterson run in 2009 and then they're there four years later, and there's kind of that connection from that standpoint. There's a, a big, I, well, I don't know if it's big, but a decent-sized Vikings following in Germany, I think, that has developed over the last few years, maybe when Morris Boringer was here. But there's kind of these little pockets of things where they have come up enough and they've played there enough that you do see some of that in the U.K. So I think that's part of it. I think this time they had, because it was a home game, this was – the first time that they have given up a game at U.S. Bank Stadium with the the season ticket base that they have at U.S. Bank Stadium. It had always been strong, right. but I think how robust it's been for them at U.S. Bank Stadium, you had a lot of season ticket holders that said, yeah, I am going to buy a ticket for that game. I'm going to make the trip. I'm going to go do the whole thing. So it's a couple of those things. I think the 5-0 start probably doesn't hurt. I mean, it certainly has not reduced the buzz about this team, but 
I, yeah, I do think they have plans to continue this. I mean, they can give up one more home game between now and 2030, but they can always go back as a road team. I think in some ways that almost is the best of both worlds for them because they don't have to give up a home game and they don't have to do as, yeah. quite as much of the heavy lifting for the game, and then you still get to activate all the stuff that you're doing over there. It, it does seem like this is part of their plan to build more of a following over there. Uh, I don't know what the end game of that is. You're not going to suddenly have tens of thousands of fans coming over from the U.K. for games or anything like that. But, you know, there's money to be made and there's brand awareness to build. All of those kinds of things, I'm sure, are part of what they're thinking. Uh, Jalen Redman waived by the Vikings, the undrafted uh, def- free agent defensive lineman who you remind us via Twitter did play in a couple of games, even posted a sack against the Texans. Uh, Vikings fans have noticed, and they want to believe this is about more than just the you know T.J. Hawkinson's return so should they get aroused about the possibility of another move here? Or what, what, is, what are the implications of Redmond being waived? I, I think it's, I mean, I, I just responded to somebody on Twitter saying this, that Occam's razor you know, <laughs> tells you that the most obvious explanation is usually the right one, uh, would make me think it's just for Hawkinson. And uh, man, they may have another move in, in the works here in terms of just adding a piece to you know, signing a guy to add roster depth, that kind of thing. I don't think there's anything particularly juicy behind it, but, you know, it's possible they're working on something that I don't know about. I mean, it's, it certainly wouldn't be the first time that that's happened. Yeah. So um, I assume it's for Hawkinson or, or for a activating a guy off the, the injured list kind of thing. But, uh, yeah, it's it's always one of those things that, especially as we get closer to the trade deadline, people start to wonder, and I, I do think – when they have cap space and when they are where they are in the standings, you know, could they look to make a move near the deadline? I, I don't think anyone should rule that out. No, we're, we're seeing more of that all the time. And I think it's interesting because folks are already getting a bit paranoid about Jones. Aaron Jones, of course, yeah. who is uh, listed as sort of what day to day or week to week, whatever the case may be. And the hope, I guess, is that he is available for, Uh, the Lions game, but I don't think there's any guarantee on that. So I think this is a compliment to to, uh, to Jones. It's that he's been already so valuable. We've seen what he can do. And I think for the average Rubits, well, I can see, I also, it reminds me what a running back can do as well. So they're already projecting that if this is going to be ongoing a little bit with Jones, we got to have another option, another veteran option that we might be able to pick up at the deadline because they don't trust his backup, in some cases, trust his backup enough. How do you think the Vikings might play that? What do you think they might think about that? Yeah, I, I do think running back depth is a little bit of a question without him. I, I think you saw it when he went out on Sunday. That running game wasn't quite as dynamic as it's been when he's been in there. He We've seen it through the first five games of the season. He's really good at, you know, I, I think the, the football phrase is getting skinny and finding his way through a space that you don't think is necessarily there. He's really good at making something out of nothing, and that can be effective when the blocking isn't great. That can be effective when he's trying to make a cut at the second level, when he's gotten some room from the offensive line. I think a lot of those things have shown up, and when he was out of that game, their offense stalled, I think, kind of around that same time. So, Ty Chandler is there, obviously. They brought Miles Gaskin back onto the active roster because I think they've used up all of their practice squad elevations with him. But, yes, adding another piece there, I could see them wanting to do that because this is the history with Jones. I mean, this is part of it that probably made the Packers say, you know what, we need to go a little bit younger. We need to go with Josh Jacobs because he has had a lot of these things where – playing 17 games of the season has not been something he's done very often. And I think it, I, when O'Connell says week to week, I would expect that his status in the Lions game is going to be very much in question. Yep. I'm not entirely sure he'll be back for that, but they're trying to head off anything long-term and with as important as he's been, keeping him fresh and keeping him ready for the long haul is going to be a really important part of this whole thing. Several individuals asking, really, a variation of this this very uh, same question. Do you think Reisner replaces Ingram when he's back? Any word on when that return is? He cannot be much worse. 
Yeah, I'm I'm interested to see that as well because I don't think Reisner is that far away. They haven't opened the practice window for him yet, but I do wonder if they are going to make that move. I mean, the fact that they were working him at right guard in training camp, I think, tells you that they're thinking about that, if that ends up needing to be something they do. Because he was starting at left guard, obviously, last year. And when they bring him back, they had kind of insult Blake Brandell as the starter there. They had said, we want him to be the guy, and he's earned the right to be the guy. So it was interesting from that perspective. But then when they start to work him at right guard, it's, okay, this is probably needing a contingency plan because we've seen this with Ed Ingram now for three years, and – there have been, I think, some good moments, but it's still a lot of the same stuff, especially in pass protection. And uh, I do wonder if that may end up being the move here at some point, if Ingram continues to struggle once Reisner is healthy. I think that's certainly something to keep an eye on because I can't imagine there's too much more um, of a, a sample size the Vikings need to say, hey, this yeah. may be something we need to look at adjusting if this isn't going to get any better. Beyond that, this is an opportunity even for a 5-0 and team to sort of have those sort of come-to-Jesus meetings, the coaches I'm talking about, and maybe even the general manager. All right, here's what we need to tweak. Here's what we need to, to do to maintain this start. Here's where we can get a little bit better, whatever. And I don't necessarily mean you know changing personnel, but even with the personnel that you have. So coming out of the Jets game... What do you think? What else do you think they're looking at? I mean, do you think they have a little concern that the QB is coming back to the pack a little, and there's something they can do? Obviously, he's the guy. Something they can do about that. Yeah. Where, where do you think their concerns might be with this extra time to reflect? I, I mean, that I would think would be near the top of the list. He has had some moments the last couple of weeks where you do see a, a little bit more of the. Kind of, I don't, I don't think the old Sam Darnold completely, but traces of that, and you saw that a little bit in the Jets game, and probably even a, a smidge of that in the Packers game as they were trying to put it away, and they they did get the long drive for the field goal that helped them keep the Packers kind of at arm's length there. But yeah, I think especially in that Jets game, it was noticeable the accuracy issues were there. Yeah, um, the turnover, the interception was. I mean, he he admitted that was not a good decision. He said the rain was not bothering him. It was not an issue of being able to grip the ball. So, if that's the fa- if that's the case, then not hitting some of those downfield throws is, I think, something to keep an eye on because that is what they have wanted from him. I think they feel good about him pushing the ball downfield. They've wanted him to do more of that. They have called a lot more of those shots. I think they like that part of his game as much as anything, but. If those are not there, you have to be able to make some of those intermediate throws. And we saw him miss a couple of those on Sunday. I think a lot of those things are part of the reason the Jets were able to come back because he did miss a couple of those that would have helped extend drives that either lead to points or make the clock that much more tenuous for the Jets. So, I mean, that is that is certainly, I think, something to watch because a lot of this with Darnold has been, he's never played this well for this long of a stretch, but five games is not 17 or 20 if they were wanted to make a playoff run or something like that. So I I would put that high on the list. I would say the offensive line is probably part of that. I mean, the right guard situation, especially they have still given up a fair amount of pressure up the middle and and they're going to have a lot of those things to consider going forward with some of the teams they're going to face as well. So I, I mean, those are the kind of things that stick out to me defensively. I think they've just been, really solid. I mean, you see them get thrown on a little bit in the last couple of weeks when they get a lead, but I think some of that is just Aaron Rodgers being able to make quick throws and people making things happen after that. I I think defensively, it's hard to ask for much more. It would be that question of where can they get the offensive efficiency back to what it was early, because we have seen a little bit of them coming back to the pack the last couple of weeks. Yeah, I was going to be my next place. There's not a lot to quibble with defensively. I guess you could say yardage from time to time, there have been a couple stretches where you know it, it feels like they've given up a lot of yards. And we're back to that age-old question, is it realistic to expect they can continue to take the ball away at this pace, which would be double of a year ago, basically three a game? I think to a certain extent, I was talking about this earlier in the week, it, this is still more an offensive issue where 
because the defense has been so good taking the ball away, it's been easier to forget about the fact that the offense is is giving up uh, the ball twice a game, which is kind of what they did averaged a year ago and one of the worst teams in the yep. league in that point. And so, to me, the lesson there still is offense, where, okay, we, we are going to have to – we got to take chances, but we got to tighten this thing up a little bit because – it may not be realistic, may not be fair to expect the defense is going to get a pick six every other week or or take the ball away three or four times a game. Yeah, I mean, that they win that game last week with a pick six and then a short field in a couple of spots as well because of turnovers that made it easier. It was not them counting on the offense to drive 90 yards like we've seen the offense do a couple of times. They had, I think, 99-yard drives in their first two games of the season. So they haven't been asked to do that. They weren't asked to do that in that Jets game as much. But, yeah, it is one of those things that, especially if Jones is out a week and you're leaning on that offense in that passing game, especially a little bit more, they are going to have to be better in that facet of things. They're just going to have to be more efficient and turning more drives into – points or turning them at least into stretches that take some time off the clock and give that defense a break because they had a lot of the second half of that game last week where they're not doing anything offensively and then it's basically you're giving the ball back in a minute, minute and a half and that gets to be a lot for a defense that is relying on a lot of players that have played a lot of snaps in the NFL and it's worked so far, they've been healthy, but you have Guys on that defense, you know, two starters who are in their 13th year in the league and a lot of guys that are well into their second contracts. So keeping everybody healthy and that complimentary football thing is part of it. And then they've also had a lot of issues on special teams, whether yeah, it's been right. the punt return last week and some of the penalties they've had in punt coverage. I think that's one of those things that if we're talking about, you know, it's, it's, it's picking nits when they're 5-0, and oh, but... The special teams' mistakes last week did help the Jets get back into that game, and I'm sure that's something the Vikings are looking at this week as well. Yeah, Stone. But we may finally have a stone cold uh, kicker. I know no one wants to ever proclaim it in this town because it's viewed as yeah, that's the beginning of the end. All we can go by is what we've seen thus far, right? And what strikes me, I was yeah. talking to Seifert about this. I've I've spent no time around the kid, but I said he he from afar, just watching him in his body language, strikes me as exactly the mentality you want in a kicker. He doesn't seem goofy. He doesn't seem interested in anything but kicking. He doesn't seem to be a guy who's going to have his head turned around by by anything. And he said, yeah, he said, that's it. He doesn't have, it there's, doesn't seem like he's, he's got a lot to say. I said, I don't think you want necessarily want a kicker who's got a lot to say or is constantly looking around like he's aware other than just kicking the ball through the goalposts. Yeah, that's pretty much what he's been. He's pretty... Calm, cool, collected. I mean, Kevin O'Connell called him cold-blooded on Sunday, and that has been mostly what we've seen. He's doing like these Walmart. He had like a Walmart back-to-school ad because he looks like he's, you know, basically mm-hmm. about to get on the bus for the first day of, you know, tenth grade or something. But um, he does not seem like a guy who is rattled by much of it. I mean, it's like if you kick in Alabama and you kick for Nick Saban, you've kicked them a lot of big games and kicked for a coach that probably doesn't have a lot of patience for kickers messing things up. So he came in about as well prepared for this as, as you could possibly be. And we saw it in training camp. We saw it in the preseason. He, I think we've seen him miss like two kicks or, you know, maybe three. If there was a block field goal in the first preseason game, but in practice he has been just as good as this. And uh, I realize they're probably fans throwing things at their radio saying, yes, Link, you're jinxing the whole thing right now. But, uh, <laughs> All I can do is yeah. just call on what I see. I don't think I'm jinxing anything. But, yeah, he's been very impressive, and I think he seems to be wired for the job. I'm looking forward to next week, actually. Um, the Lions are, of course, by then they will have played Dallas again. They could be 4-1. and one. They could be 3-2. and two. I guess it's possible, but I think it's uh, it's going to be fun. Um, and, you know, over the years we couldn't always say that, but it's now become um, uh, in, involves now two teams that I think have, at this point, a legitimate right to say we're, we're battling for the division. So we look forward to previewing that uh, a week from today. Yeah, it should be fun. I'm trying to think of the last time we've had the Vikings and Lions as back-to-back yeah. winners of this division, probably 30-something years ago. But, yeah, that one should be a lot of fun. The place should be uh, pretty loud. It, it's uh, it's going to be a fun week to get ready for that one. Thank you.
All right. Thanks, Dan. We'll talk to you next that, week. That's Ben Gessling, Standard Heating and Air Conditioning, the fine sponsor of the Ben Gessling segment. Uh, let's do this. Let's prepare for the top five at five. Lavelle's going to be with us in the five o'clock hour, but uh, top five will include a very successful night for Minnesota sports last night.